Hi, Professor. We are Group 36. I am Zhen. Today, we're going to introduce our machine learning project titled IEEE CIS Fraud Detection. Our group consists of Andrew, Darian, Liang Wei, myself, and Qi Ming. The e-commerce has been a booming industry due to its popularity and convenience. And e-payments is the main method used in this e-commerce platform. However, e-payment can be compromised and they may be used by other people other than the owner himself. So there is a need of detection of fraudulent transactions. With the rise of AI, ML can be trained to detect fraudulent transactions with high accuracy. So the objective of this project is to train an ML model to detect fraudulent transactions accurately. This presentation will be split into seven parts, data exploration, pre-processing strategy, feature engineering, feature selection, training models, experiments, and lastly, conclusion. The given data consists of four parts, uh, two for training and two for testing. The training data is split into transactions and identity, and the training data consists of many rows and columns. For data exploration, we will take a look at the transaction data set first. It consists of information regarding the transactions and a fraudulent transaction is represented with zero and one represents a fraudulent transaction. The training data set also consists of categorical variables that need to be dealt with separately so that the training model can interpret them correctly. Initial data exploration uh, showed that the, there is an imbalance in the transaction data set with 96.5% of the data uh, are actually non-fraudulent and only 3.5% are fraudulent. Hello Professor, my name is Chi Ming. Next I will be talking more about data exploration and processing strategy. For identity data set, we observe two different types of variables. They are continuous and categorical. ID 1 to 11 fall under the continuous variable. ID 12 to 38, device type and device info fall under categorical. For continuous variables, we pick up a few columns and we observe that for each column, the name values have the highest weightage. Similarly, for categorical variables, we pick a few columns and display it in the form of pie chart. We observe that the name values have the highest weightage as well. For transaction data set, we observe that the variables are stored in the text format and are in categorical as well. Similarly, from the bar chart, we observe the name values having the highest weightage as well. In pre-processing strategy, we use NAND processing. For NAND processing, in the given example, in the these two column, it changes the value from NAND value to negative 999. So moving on from data exploration and pre-processing, we perform feature engineering to create more features. The strategies that we have performed is label encoding with memory reduction, combining and splitting columns, and lastly, frequency encoding. After which, we perform validation on the features that we have engineered. So for the validation of features, we rely on the XGP classifier. So we train our model with the first 80% of the data set and validate it with the rest. The metric that we use here is actually AUC, which refers to the area under the receiver operating characteristic. The AUC value that we obtain is usually between 0 and 1. So a high AUC value means that the model can distinguish classes better, and this means that the feature is actually good and a low AUC value means that the model cannot distinguish between the classes and this means that the feature is not really useful to us. So initially, our objective was to validate newly engineered features in order to keep or discard them. So if the model uh, produces a higher AUC value with this newly added feature, we will keep the feature. And likewise, if it's not, we will discard it. However, through experimentation, we discovered that some engineered features, although they did not increase the local validation AUC, 
it actually improved the final evaluation score, which is actually more important. So our group decided to change our approach, which is to, this, to keep features that ultimately improve the final evaluation score. And our group suspect that um, the differences between the validation score and the final evaluation score could be due to the disparity between the training and testing data set. And this could be due to the different trends in the data, hence the, um, the discrepancy in the results. The first feature engineering technique that was performed is label encoding with memory reduction. The aim of label encoding is to convert non-numerical data, for example objects and strings, into numerical data that the model can understand. After label encoding was performed, we also performed memory reduction. So numerical values greater than 32,000 will be represented with type IN32, which is 4 bytes. Otherwise, IN16 will be used, which is 2 bytes. So we discovered that 30 columns will be labeled encoded. Examples of these columns include P email domain, device type, and device info. The next technique is combining features. Features that represent similar information can be combined. Columns with string values can be concatenated before label encoding is performed, whereas columns with numeric values can be combined with arithmetic operations. This is helpful in instances where values from individual columns might not correlate with the target variable but their combination could show a correlation to the target variable. Two columns that we combined were device type and device info. Columns can also be split into multiple columns. String values can be split on the delimiter and float values can also be split into its integer and fractional values. We split the transaction amount, which is a float value, and created a new column that comprises of the value of its sense. The last feature engineering technique is frequency encoding. So in frequency encoding, we group features by its value and we obtain counts for each value. We then create a new column with the relative frequency values that ranges between 0 and 1. Examples of columns where frequency encoding will perform are card 1 and address 1. We also experimented with feature selection in our project. Firstly, correlation analysis was performed. Columns that are highly correlated might have identical effects on the target variable. We set a correlation coefficient value to select the columns to be removed. An 80% coefficient value returns 252 columns, whereas a coefficient value of 90% returns 195 columns. However, removing these columns reduces the evaluation score. So the next feature selection method that we have experimented is actually the select KBS method. So the select KBS method helps us to select the key number of features using a scoring function that we have chosen. So for a classification problem like this, we actually use the scoring function G2 to rate the features and the target variable. Um, in this case, is fraud. So the, the, based on the scoring function, a value will be generated and the features will be ranked according to their values. So a low rating value means that the select feature is actually independent of the target and this means that it's not actually useful. But a high rating value means that the selected feature is actually non-random. This means that it's most highly related and useful to us. So for testing, we selected our top 300 and top 250 features while removing the rest. However, the results of the final evaluation score was not good enough. So in this two feature selection method that we have covered and experimented, uh, although it did not uh, improve the final evaluation score, it still managed to reduce our training time by quite a significant bit. Now, we move on to the models used for experiments. We built our predictive models using two state-of-the-art machine learning models. The first is the XGBoost model, which is developed in 2014. The next one is a light GBM model developed in 2017. This model works based on a concept called gradient boosting, which has been shown in several recent Kaggle challenges to produce superior performance. The differences between these models lie in their implementation. They use different training techniques, optimizations, and handle various types of data differently. So let's start by getting an idea of how gradient boosting works. So it goes like this. If we can account for errors in the model's prediction, we will be able to reduce it. The problem now is how do we know the error? In gradient boosting, we estimate this using another model. Next, give an illustration of the idea. Now, assume we have a sample in which its label is 1. That's what we want to predict. Sadly, our model predicts a 3 for that sample. 
that gives an error of negative 2 because the actual outcome is lesser by 2. If you know that the error is negative 2, you can change our model to account for it. Let's formalize this. Let f be our current model. It takes in a sample and makes a prediction. So in this example, it is a tree. Then now, we build a model g to estimate the error. It takes in a sample again and produces an estimation of the error. In this example, it will output a negative 2. Then, we can create a better model f new, which sums the output of f and g. You can think of it as g updating and accounting for the errors of f. Notice that the updated prediction is better. However, g is not 100% accurate in predicting the error. So the new model will still have errors a bit lesser. So to further reduce the error, we can repeat the above process, build new Gs for new Fs until the model performance is great. G and F can be any arbitrary function approximator, but most of the time, a tree is used. So why is this called gradient boosting? Mathematically, taking the negative gradient of the loss function gives the error. Let's use the mean square error as an example. Note that this works for other loss functions as well. The mean square error is y true minus y prediction square. So when we take its gradient with respect to our prediction, we get negative y true minus y prediction. And just y true minus y prediction if we apply negative, which is the error like what we see in the previous slide and what we want to predict. And since we are predicting the gradient, we call this process gradient boosting. Intuitively, we are shifting our predictions in a direction that reduces the total error of the model, while keeping in mind not to overfit. We can also think about this idea as a form of gradient descent. Now that we know the idea behind XGBoost and LightGBM, let's compare the differences between the two. Most of the features introduced try to make the training process faster and more efficient. Let's start with XGBoost. When deciding the split point, Typical tree will try all possible splits before deciding on the best one. This is too slow. To speed things up, XGBoost forms an approximate histogram of the values in the candidate feature. Then group the samples based on their values and confidence levels. The model then finds the best split for the groups. Also, XGBoost has a special way of handling missing data by setting the most probable direction for the NAND values as the default direction. In runtime, we take the default path whenever we get a missing value. When building a new 3G, we use only a portion of the samples to reduce training time. On top of that, XGBoost randomly selects a bunch of features as candidates. This reduces training time and decorrelates the tree which can bring up the model performance. It's the idea used in random forests. Lastly, there are various hardware optimizations. For LGBM, exclusive feature bundling reduces training time and memory by reducing the number of columns in the dataset. When building a tree, gradient based one site sampling or GOSS uses a special sampling technique that prioritizes samples with high errors. Finally, LGBM is in many ways similar to the XGBoost model. With knowledge about the models, let's move on to the experiments. So after discussion of XGBoost and LightGBM, we tested our engineered features with these two models. So as you can see in the table below, XGBoost and LightGBM was tested with and without the engineered features. So in both cases, XGBoost actually performed slightly better. And the cell highlighted in green is our final evaluation score for this Kaggle project. Since XGBoost performs better than LightGBM in both cases, we have decided to use XGBoost as our model in our solution. In conclusion, our group learned how to tackle a binary classification problem on Kaggle. So we have developed an approach which is to understand the problem, examining and exploring the dataset, to designing a solution, implementing it, and to test the solution. So this approach helped us to develop a public score of 0 0.941030, which is top 50%, and a private score of 0 0.908486. And this is a top 55%. I will end my presentation here. I thank you for your attention and stay well and stay safe. Thank you.